what is happening in the United States is a transformation of the political system here. And it, uh, it's very hard to explain this to foreigners uh, because the American system is so different. We don't have a parliamentary system in the United States. Uh, we, we have a duopoly between two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, that have basically the same uh, position. Uh, the Republicans appeal uh, to the Christian uh, church uh, fundamentalists, uh, to the rural areas, uh, to the blue collar uh, working class, uh, and uh, support monopolies and the mining industry, big corporations. The Democrats are the pro-war party. Uh, they represent the professional managerial class. They're uh, centered in the big cities, uh, especially uh, ever since the Irish came to America in the late 19th century. Uh, they settled in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and became uh, the police force and uh, the political regime. You had Mayor Daley in Chicago, who was able to steal the 1960 election uh, for Kennedy from uh, Richard Nixon with ballot stuffing. So you, you have the Democrats and the Republicans traditionally uh, locking up the uh, ability to nominate who's going to be uh, representing people in Congress uh, and in the Senate. Uh, the, it's very hard for a third party to get on uh, the ballots uh, in, in the various states. Every state in America, all 50, has its own regulation. You need uh, maybe 20,000 signatures on the ballot. Usually some signature is someone who shouldn't be on a, a sheet of, say, 50 uh, signatures, uh, someone who's not registered to vote. Uh, the whole 50 are thrown out. Uh, it costs about four million dollars to uh, just to get the signatures and file the legal papers that it takes to get on uh, a ballot to be elected. So not many uh, parties can do this. The rules have sort of left everything to a ballot as a third party uh, so that people can can vote. Uh, the ballots have the Republican column, the Democratic column, and then you have any a uh, third party they can get on. Very often, this can be for a local election, uh, but in the past, there, it's a duopoly, and uh, the the choice is between, in this year, Donald Trump for the Republicans and President Biden. Well, there is an enormous reaction by uh, all Americans. Only 40% of uh, Americans, uh, well, 40% uh, approval rate of President Biden. That's very low. That's the lowest approval rate of any sitting president since World War II. Most people can't stand him. He is the war president. There have been university protests against the genocide in Gaza, and uh, Biden has supported uh, uh, not only the police putting down these riots, but Columbia University here in New York. Uh, Columbia has a agreement with Israel that Israeli army officers can register in the school. And the Israeli army officers are going around and spraying Arab students and students protesting, supporting the United Nations. They're spraying them with poison liquid that eat into the skin that Israeli scientists have discovered so that they can find out who in the crowd they want to kill in Israel, but here, who, who, who they want to just cover with uh, filth. The Biden is, is supporting this. Uh, he's uh, uh, announced that he's a Zionist. Uh, and the anti-war movement in the United States is so strong that uh, nobody can see how Biden can win. So for the first time, this is opening a uh, opportunity to third parties. The main party in the United States, as in other countries, is the Green Party. And uh, the candidate there is Jill Stein, and I'm an economic advisor to her. And she is the only anti-war uh, candidate who's running for president. Of all the parties, you have RFK Kennedy Jr., who is running, he says now, on the libertarian ticket. He wanted to run as a Democrat, but uh, they wouldn't let him in. You have Cornell West who originally was going to run on the Green Party, and uh, 
had appointed me as one of his economic advisors, but then he decided he wanted to do all of his statements all by himself, and uh, he doesn't have any organization behind him, so he has no way of getting the signatures to get on the ballot. There is a uh, right-wing uh, Democrat uh, group uh, uh, founded by uh, the CIA Democrat uh, uh, lady from Nevada and by the West uh, Virginia uh, coal lobbyist uh, who want, they called uh, no, uh, uh, no party or no uh, uh, sort of independent party. You're going to have all sorts of people uh, uh, running for these uh, uh, on the ballot. So instead of just two lines in America, you're going to have many lines, which I guess there are some countries in Europe uh, with a parliamentary system that have many different parties running. Not, there, there's never been anything like that in the United States before. There may have been local uh, parties uh, in maybe one state or one city for local representatives, but never for the political representatives. Well, as you know, there was an attempt to uh, deny the 2020 election uh, by Trump, uh, claiming that it was uh, fixed. Uh, but uh, th this is going to be a different kind of uh, election that uh, changes all of the rules. In the United States, uh, there has to be a majority of uh, uh, votes for one president uh, candidate or another candidate. But if the third party uh, uh, together, the three uh, third parties now, if uh, neither Trump nor Biden has enough uh, votes, then the, uh, the election is thrown into the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives right now is dominated by the Republicans. Uh, the, uh, the, Rep uh, the Democrats still have control of the Senate. That means that the Republicans uh, would be able to presumably uh, nominate a uh, president, but there are not enough of them. Uh, they're, they're very closely balanced, both in the Senate and the House. And uh, so what that means is that the third party candidate can do what happened in Germany. Uh, where the Green Party said, well, okay, we're the third party. We can throw our weight behind either the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats uh, to decide who's going to be in the government, or we can make a, an alliance against uh, the, uh, the right wing alternative for Deutschland uh, and uh, the left wing, the, the Links Party. Well, something like that can happen in America. So uh, depending on who gets the most third party votes? It could be Jill Stein, it could be RFK Jr., it could be uh, someone else who may run. Uh, it could be Christine Cinema is the uh, uh, lady who's running on the no labels uh, ticket. Well, they can all make their deals with the Republicans and Democrats to say, okay, we will uh, have your nominee as president. And it doesn't have to be Trump. It doesn't have to be Biden. It can be whoever the House decides on. And if you need to get an agreement among people, they can decide on anyone they want from any party. <clears throat> well, obviously, what people are going to do is say, oh, OK, who's going to be Secretary of the Treasury? Who's going to be head of the FBI? Because the, the FBI, it's, it's uh, developed into a police state here. Uh, and the FBI uh, in, in 2020 was uh, suppressing all of the information about President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, being an agent for the Ukrainian government, receiving millions of dollars for himself and the big guy. The FBI and the CIA said that uh, dozens of anal analysts all said, no, this is a plot of President Putin, the laptop of Hunter Biden that has all of the incriminating payoffs and bribery to make President Biden an agent of a foreign power, an agent of the Ukrainian government for money, committing treason against the United States, going to war simply because he's got under the table payments to his son that is shared with the family wealth that we have a gangster as president. And the whole country is aware of this as president, as uh, ex-president uh, Trump is explaining every day. Well, Trump says, if he's president, he's going to clean out the FBI that has become a police state. 
He is going to clean out the uh, CIA uh, and the Defense Department that uh, also have become their own form of the police state. Uh, he has pledged to withdraw American troops from the Near East. He said before, as president, he directed the army uh, before 2020 to withdraw the troops from Iraq and from Syria and elsewhere in the Near East. And uh, the army simply refused to do it. If you're president, what do you do? And you give an order. Well, what if everybody ignores it? What if you put your own guy as head of the uh, FBI or CAA, uh, and uh, he just says, okay, I want you to do this. And everybody says, well, you just sit at your desk. It's how you, you have to really change the whole bureaucracy of the FBI, the CIA. You have to know somebody who knows who to remove, how to put your own people in key positions. Trump wasn't a politician. He was a real estate gangster uh, and uh, had no idea of how politics works. This time around, he's got people who actually know how uh, the, uh, the, the police state works. Uh, it's called the deep state uh, in America. And uh, he's pledged to clean up the deep state. Uh, and of course, the Democrats say, well, of course, you just want to put your own people in charge of the FBI your own people in charge of the CAA. So uh, this is basically what the whole election discussion is uh, in the United States. Which party will control the secret police and the uh, CAA and American foreign policy? Well, uh, the splits uh, right now, uh, the, ironic as it may appear, uh, the Republicans are the main opponents of the war in the Near East, uh, just as Trump had wanted to withdraw the troops before. Uh, in the United States, for the last century, going back to World War I and World War II, there was always an isolationist party in the United States. That was the Republican Party, especially under Senator Taft uh, uh, of Ohio when I was uh, uh, a teenager, wanting uh, America not to be involved in foreign wars. Uh, there is uh, now uh, a similar uh, response at the... Uh, grassroots level uh, in the Republican Party. That's why they are refusing to approve of the budget that funds the American government be, uh, unless uh, President uh, Biden refuse, uh, takes removes the $50 billion that's supposed to go to pay for the war in Ukraine. Uh, most Americans are against the war in Ukraine, and that's why they're opposing the Democrats. Uh, and uh, the Republicans are threatening just not to approve any uh, anything at all, uh, any uh, budget at all. Well, uh, in the last week in the United States, you had President Biden saying, OK, I know that uh, you uh, Republicans are uh, want to stop immigration in the United States. I will agree to uh, put a whole army on uh, the southern border and stop the inflow of immigrants if you let me uh, pay $50 billion to give to Ukraine so that they can fight Russia. Uh, there's still maybe 300,000 Ukrainian men who can go to war. Uh, Biden wants, them all, wants to kill them all. I want to give this money for President Zelensky to send the remaining Ukrainian men and women to war so they can all be killed, leaving an empty state there. I don't know what it is. And the Republicans are saying, well, uh, the Republicans are saying, why on earth uh, would you want to do that? Are you, why would you empty out a Ukrainian state? Uh, well, are you planning on moving uh, the, uh, the Palestinians there? Or are you planning on moving uh, the Israelis there? Uh, but Ukraine has spent the whole autumn, the last three months, actually since summer, with an attempted offensive, and they may have gained 10 square miles and lost uh, 100 or 200,000 men just running into the uh, Russian uh, meat grinder, it's called. Uh, Ukrainian men are being picked up off the street and thrust into the army with no training at all and given a gun without even being taught how to use it and sent into the trenches to told to attack uh, Russia. Well, you can understand why Russia is simply sitting where it is and not extending its move. 
It is trying to take one or two really big cities, which are key cities for the transport route in Ukraine. But the Russian army and President Putin said, why should we attack Ukraine? They're simply committing suicide in mad rushes trying to attack us. We're just uh, sitting here and we're shooting them as they're coming. Uh, there's no reason for our army to go into the field and be shot. We're all uh, safe behind our uh, barriers. We have three lines of defenses. We're sitting here. We're just shooting them. Well, you can imagine why uh, any uh, person with good, normal feelings said, this is a crazy war. Uh, the Ukrainians don't want it. It's a war that's sponsored by the uh, United States, by the neocon, simply because it says, well, every Ukrainian that dies, at least they, they use up one bullet of Russia. And if uh, we can have another 200,000 Ukrainians die, well, at least 200,000 bullets will be shot and, you know, uh, Russia will have less copper left. This is crazy. Uh, because Russia can mine <laughs> more copper. It can produce more bullets. Uh, the Russian army and its armaments, its uh, tanks, its bullets, its rifles, its missiles have all been uh, increasing uh, while uh, NATO and the United States don't have uh, any, uh, hard, any more, more tanks, rifles, bullets, missiles. They're all exhausted, uh, as you've seen now. So uh, you have an end play of the war abroad uh, with America only having the atom bomb and uh, bombers left. That's the one weapon that the United States has and the only thing that it can use in the case of war. Well, you're seeing that erupt not only in Ukraine, but you've seen it spread since uh, October 2nd to Israel. The war that's going on there that is now spread uh, throughout uh, the Near East, uh, the, the Palestinians, the Arabs throughout the Near East, and even the poorest population in the Near East, which are the Houthis, uh, have decided to uh, 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 block uh, ships that are carrying arms and raw materials to Israel uh, through uh, the Red Sea, through the, uh, 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 the Suez Canal, uh, they're they're trying to block all of the ship transports by uh, uh, announcing uh, they're they're not going to let any uh, American, Israeli, or NATO ships uh, go to is uh, to Israel. And they uh, actually uh, apparently uh, sunk a ship yesterday, and they've announced uh, that they've stopped all of the sea traffic there uh, in in uh, oil, uh, and they haven't yet closed the two canals. But uh, the United States has now uh, ed said uh, they are escalating the war in the Near East. Uh, President Biden said uh, America, we're, we're out of uh, uh, armaments. America doesn't have an army. Uh, they, they don't have an industry to produce uh, many uh, tanks and weapons, uh, so they can't really replace the stocks like Russia can. Uh, so uh, Amer uh, essentially, uh, Biden and his uh, Secretary of State Blinken and uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, have said, well, America's power is going down and down and down. The power of other countries is going up. China, Russia, the BRICS plus, uh, we're losing. We're going to be much weaker next year than we are this year. So if we're going to have a war to try to prevent the world from breaking in two, from becoming independent, if we're going to have a war to try to uh, keep control of the Near East and its oil, then we'd better fight now because uh, even if we lose, we're not going to lose as bad as we will next year or the year after that or the year after that. America is going downhill. The other countries are up. So this is actually leading the military to say, this is our last chance. Uh, we, we'd better fight before now before we get even weaker. And uh, that is leading to the adventurism that has led the United States to uh, uh, step up its uh, uh, support of its foreign legions. The US has two main foreign legions. It has uh, Al Qaeda and the ISIS and the Islamic terrorist groups that serve as America's army to fight uh, countries that America wants to overthrow. Iraq, Syria, Libya, 
and uh, supporters of Iran. The other army, of course, is the Israeli army, which is fighting the Arabs to secure Israel as a military base. The word that has been used for the last half century in America is Israel is our landed aircraft carrier in the Near East. We don't have to have actual ships as aircraft carriers. In fact, uh, the United States had three major aircraft carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean on the Indian Ocean. And it's realized that if you have an aircraft carrier, Russia can uh, simply knock it out or Iran can simply knock it out with a, a single bomb. It takes 10 minutes to sink an aircraft carrier and uh, they're just sitting ducks uh, there. And so the United States is moving them out of uh, range. Uh, the, uh, Naval uh, warships and aircraft carriers no longer are effective uh, weapons in uh, any country's army because they can all be attacked by modern missiles so uh, quickly and so totally. The only way that America can actually uh, have a place to land is in Israel. So, of course, America is supporting Israel, quite apart from the fact that uh, many uh, uh, of uh, President Biden's cabinet, including himself, are Zionists and support Israel uh, on religious grounds against uh, Islam. So you're having today something very much like the religious wars. Uh, I think it would help uh, people in China and Asia understand the Western world. If you realize the last hundred years of religious wars that uh, shaped all of European development. Uh, you had uh, especially the fight between Catholics and Protestants when uh, uh, you had the Catholic countries of France uh, having the uh, Catholics go house, and house to house in Paris and other cities uh, and uh, try to kill the Catholics within them. America was settled very largely by uh, Europeans who fled the religious wars of their countries. Uh, the Huguenots were the French Protestants, and the Catholics uh, uh, essentially wanted to do to the Protestants what Israel uh, wants to do to the Palestinians today. They, uh, the, the Protestants were being killed. What did they do? Uh, they had an option. They could go to America, and they did. Same thing in uh, Germany. There were fights between, uh, uh, there were peasant wars, there were idealistic wars, there were Christian wars. Uh, America was settled by utopian uh, groups that led left from uh, uh, Germany and other European countries, Switzerland, uh, and of course in uh, Ireland in the 19th century, you had uh, the war between uh, the Protestant uh, landowners, uh, the British aristocracy, uh, in uh, who controlled the land in Ireland leading to the potato famine. There was no real famine. There were plenty of potatoes and grain, but uh, uh, the landlords sent the grain to England. Uh, and what did the uh, Irish do? They moved out to the United States. So you, you have uh, an American population that fled the religious wars in their own countries uh, for the last uh, 500 years, ever since uh, America was discovered. And uh, uh, you have uh, Europeans have uh, no longer fought primarily over religious wars. The only place that you're having something like this religious war of uh, kill everybody who's not our religion, you're having that only in the Near East. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, what happened uh, uh, before in Europe to understand where are uh, the Palestinians or the Israelis going to go. Uh, most of the uh, diplomats who've been commenting on the situation, uh, such as uh, the former uh, negotiator, Alistair Crook, uh, negotiating for Britain uh, for uh, some kind of uh, peace between uh, Israel and uh, Palestine, said that it's now uh, what is obvious since last October is uh, there cannot be a two-state solution that has to be either one or the other. Either uh, Israel will be only for the Zionist population there, uh, the Jewish population, uh, or for the Arab population. 
But uh, uh, President Netanyahu, with the full support of his entire cabinet, says, we are going to kill every Islamic person in the country because they are a threat to us. They're a threat to us because of all the awful things we've done to them that, of course, they're going to try to kill us because we've been killing them ever since 1967. In fact, we've been killing them ever since 1948 when Israel was formed. So, of course, we have to kill them or they will kill us. Well, uh, <laughs> nobody can figure out what is going to happen to the population that leaves. Uh, Israel is trying to bomb uh, the Gaza Strip along the Mediterranean Sea, uh, trying to drive the population into Egypt. Uh, but because America has backed uh, the uh, right-wing Egyptian government uh, and uh, arranged a regime change with the what it called the Arab Spring, uh, where the uh, Egyptian population tried to overthrow the dictator, and America simply imposed the dictator's own chosen successor, Sisi, uh, as uh, his successor, well, you're having uh, 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 Egypt not literally not able to absorb uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and nobody can figure out where they can go. And uh, President Netanyahu and his entire staff said, they don't have to go anywhere. We will kill them all. Well, obviously, uh, the Palestinians say, we cannot live in a state that's run by a, a police force and an army that is dedicated to killing us on religious grounds, saying, well, it's all in the Bible. Amalek uh, uh, was, was supposed to be destroyed. The children, especially. And so the army has come in and said, uh, there's a reason why we're bombing all of the maternity wards and hospitals. We're bombing the hospitals. We're especially bombing two groups, children, because the children will could grow up to be voters and they'd vote against the Israelis and the, they could grow up and join the army and we're killing the reporters. We're targeting the journalists so that the Western world cannot see what we're doing because we know that the, the Christians and the atheists and just about everybody else do, doesn't think that it's good to come in and uh, kill uh, soldiers who are carrying uh, and civilians who are carrying white flags of surrender and uh, they're surrendering and they're simply shot. Uh, we know that the world doesn't like that, so we've got to kill the reporters so there's nobody to report this uh, and we'll just keep it to ourselves. Well, of course, they're not keeping it to themselves. All over the United States, there are demonstrations against the genocide, genocide that's coming there. And then, of course, last week, you had the uh, International Court of Justice rule that indeed uh, this uh, is genocide. Well, the response by Netanyahu has simply fanned the flames of discontent. Uh, Netanyahu has said, uh, this is, uh, the United Nations is vile. The International Court of Justice is uh, vile, and uh, uh, with, uh, uh, he used other adjectives, uh, abhorrent, uh, uh, terrible. Uh, and uh, w the surprising thing is that the United States has agreed with this. Uh, the United States has said, it's so awful that the United States says that uh, Israel cannot kill unarmed uh, citizens, that it cannot uh, do genocide, that we are stopping all contributions to the United Nations Relief Agency. Uh, <coughs> well, you can see uh, what's happening now. Uh, Jill Stein of the uh, Greek party has said, uh, there should be an international force uh, of, from other countries that are bringing food and water to Israel, to, uh, to the Gaza Strip, and to the West Bank, where also the uh, uh, you have the settlers going out with guns and uh, sh uh, just killing the, uh, the uh, uh, Palestinian settlers, saying, we want your house, we want you out of the land, and there's um, as much killing in the uh, West Bank uh, of uh, Palestine as there is uh, in uh, the Gaza Strip. Well, uh, so what Joel Stein is calling for is an international troop saying, yes, bring food, bring water, bring medical care, and also bring soldiers to protect the Palestinians from being murdered by, uh, uh, by the troops. Well, instead of, uh, 
uh, of sending American troops to actually prevent genocide. Uh, Biden is sending troops. He said, we're all for it. We're sending American troops there. Uh, we're going to do, uh, apparently, there's uh, some attack that is being planned because Biden said, uh, we, we do have a lot of uh, airplanes uh, and, uh, uh, in uh, Iraq and in Syria, but we know that, uh, that we're going to do something that they're going to be blown up. So we're sending all of our refueling airplanes there so that we can send planes over uh, to bomb. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure to bomb Iran uh, and to be refueled by the planes. There's a, a general a war there. So it looks to everybody that why is the United States moving troops there not to protect the Palestinians from genocide, but to support the genocide uh, and to extend it to Iran. And basically the American position is, well, we overthrew the uh, democratically elected Iranian government, Mossadegh, in 1954. We put in the vicious dictator, uh, the Shah of Iran, uh, that uh, set up a secret police and mass torture. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, then stole Iran's uh, money, uh, we grabbed uh, the oil, they must hate us. And because they must hate us because we've been so awful to them, because we've killed so many Iranians uh, and isolated their country, and because we backed uh, a war that killed uh, maybe uh, uh, 500,000 to a million Iranians uh, when we uh, paid Saddam Hussein to use the uh, Iraqi army to attack Iran from Iraq. Uh, that of course they must hate us, so we have to destroy them because we've created hatred in the world. Well, he also said, we've been so mean to Russia and China that they must hate us, so we've made them into the enemy. So let's just realize they're our enemy, we've made them the enemy, We've uh, the West has uh, uh, been uh, brutalizing China, Russia, and Asia uh, for the last few hundred years. Uh, we've got to uh, fight them now. Well, you have America being the whole force of war in the world. Well, you can imagine, even in the United States, the population is doesn't want to go to war. There's never going to be a draft again. Other countries can have a military draft. And you're seeing the most extreme example in Ukraine. Nobody uh, can ever have a draft uh, in the United States. Since the Vietnam War, the Americans say, we don't want to die to fight a war for American foreign policy just to control the world on behalf of Wall Street and the large corporations. I mean, this isn't our war. So uh, the Americans don't feel that the war in Ukraine or the war in the Near East is their war. Uh, and uh, that's why there's, uh, they're, they're looking, there's trying to get an alternative government. The newspapers daily talk about uh, President Trump's uh, position of, uh, he's obviously in, the lead, every poll shows that President Trump is, uh, would de defeat uh, President Biden if the election uh, were held today. And people are urging President Trump, uh, be very careful what airplane you take. Uh, make sure there's no bomb on it. Uh, make sure you have protection. And uh, I think that there uh, is a gambling uh, site. I don't know if it's in Ireland or England where they're saying, what are the on uh, Trump li living long enough to actually be on the ballot? But of course, they, uh, there's no need to uh, threaten his life until he actually wins uh, uh, the election. Uh, there, the Democrats are trying to control the voting process now, as they tried to do in uh, 2020 uh, so successfully. And they're trying to uh, control the voting uh, system, not only against Trump, but against the third party uh, candidates, including uh, Jill Stein. So uh, this uh, it, I'm sure there are going to be many movies and thrillers uh, about uh, what's happening this year, but the whole world is changing as a result of what's happened in the last few months uh, in uh, the Near East and in Ukraine. Uh, the two armies uh, that America has, uh, the Ukrainian army, uh, the Israeli army, and uh, ISIS, the uh, uh, Arab uh, uh, Wahhabi uh, terrorist uh, army, uh, are uh, uh, are at, at war, and uh, this is uh, some. Uh, the effect is uh, not increasing American power. Uh, the Americans actually seem to be 
surprised when other countries are responding to what America is doing by building up their own military power. Last week, you had a very major alliance between Russia and Iran, mutual aid, mutual trade. Iran has been uh, providing small bombers to Russia, various uh, weapons to Russia. Russia has been providing air defense equipment to Iran and to other Near Eastern states. You're having the whole world uh, geared up for some kind of showdown. And uh, you have the Democrats saying there's one way that uh, in the West, presidents always try to get reelected. You have a war going uh, uh, during the election. And during the war, the theory is that populations will always vote for the party in power. Uh, number one, because they look at the party in power to defend them in a war. And number two, because it would be unpatriotic to overthrow uh, the other party. Uh, yesterday, you had the former uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, saying that uh, if you're opposing the war in Ukraine, you're supporting President Putin uh, and Russia. If you're supporting uh, the Palestinians, you're supporting President Putin. Uh, if you're against the war, you're Putin's puppet. Uh, this is exactly what uh, Hillary Clinton accused <clears throat> Uh, President uh, Bush, uh, President uh, uh, Trump of doing in, in 2020. She said in 2016 and again in 2020, Trump is a, a Russian agent. This is uh, the equivalent of the Americans calling their uh, political opponents communists. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, if you wanted to uh, try to accuse an opponent of something, you said he was a, a communist. No matter what they thought, if you were for women's rights, you were a communist. If you were for democracy, you were a communist. Well, needless to say, that made America, a lot of people saying, gee, what is this communism? Let's look into it. Well, right now, uh, they're saying you're Putin's puppet by, uh, if you're anti-war, you're supporting Putin. <clears throat> you can imagine that there's a lot of American sympathy growing for Putin, thinking, well, if, if, uh, if, if he's behind the anti-war movement, let's, uh, let's support Russia, China, and uh, you're, you're, this is the kind of feeling from the Western end that is uh, uh, splitting the whole world. Well, you can see within the West, there's a split between the United States and Europe. Uh, we've been discussing on this site for the last year, uh, maybe two years now, uh, the effect of the United States uh, blowing up Nord Stream and preventing Germany from getting Russian oil and gas. Uh, the United States says, don't worry, we'll sell you liquefied natural gas. It'll cost you six times as much, but at least you won't freeze at night. Well, uh, German industry hasn't frozen, it's closed down. Uh, every month, you have another major German firm either going out of business or relocating. Uh, it's a chemical uh, activity, it's industrial activity, either to the United States or to China because they can't get energy there. Well, the United States has said, don't worry, you can get uh, uh, liquidified natural gas, LNG, uh, build your own terminals. So uh, the uh, Eurozone has been building its own shipping terminals so that they can accept ships bringing in liquefied natural gas from America. Well, America uh, said, begun to help by saying, we're going to build new natural gas ports so that we can export our natural gas surplus, especially from fracking uh, oil, uh, to Europe. But just uh, two days ago, President Biden said, well, you know, uh, we've got to uh, join the uh, opposition to global warming, so uh, I'm not going to uh, approve money to build these LNG ports. Uh, I'm sorry, Europe, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, sell you the oil uh, and the gas that you wanted to heat your houses with, but look at the bright side. Uh, uh, it'll uh, You'll be more environmentally responsible not to heat your houses, not to have your industry. You'll be more responsible if you go into a depression. So all of the uh, newspapers uh, report uh, the main banks and the main uh, economic uh, research organizations is forecasting uh, a deepening depression in Germany that will pull all of the Eurozone into a deepening financial depression. That is one of the economic consequences 
uh, of the war. And if the United States escalates uh, the fighting at all, uh, either by uh, supporting an Israeli attack on Lebanon, uh, where the Hezbollah uh, is, very, uh, is the Lebanese army uh, supporting uh, the uh, Arab population, the Islamic population there, or uh, if it attacks Iran, uh, that uh, you will immediately have the Suez Canal and the uh, uh, Straits of Hormuz uh, closed down, shipping will be closed down, where on earth is Europe going to be able to get, uh, and, and Asia, able to get uh, its oil if uh, the Near Eastern oil, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, uh, all of the other oil producers, uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's no more uh, uh, surface trade anymore. Well, a decade ago, uh, China, President Xi, and the Chinese anticipated uh, the problems of sea transport, and they said there's a way to overcome it. You do overland transport. That's the whole Belt and Road Initiative that China started. Uh, it realizes that uh, if, uh, if indeed the war that the United States is fighting in the Near East leads to uh, an Arab response, an Iranian response, of closing down uh, the uh, oil, the uh, ocean oil trade, uh, with uh, Near Eastern oil, that uh, the only way of getting this oil is going to be uh, overland. And that's why uh, much of the uh, jockeying for geopolitical position between China and the United States uh, has uh, uh, been uh, all about. Well, uh, China obviously is very concerned because it hasn't yet built the whole uh, Belt and Road. Uh, 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 infrastructure. So the question is, if oil is trade is uh, uh, blocked by uh, Yemen, uh, by uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries blocking the trade, how is China and how are other Asian countries going to be able uh, to get the oil that they've depended on for the last uh, half century? That is uh, uh, the ba their basic geopolitical concern. And that is why China has been moving uh, its own ships uh, and its own uh, uh, forces uh, into the Indian Ocean and into the, uh, uh, the, the, the Near Eastern region. So you're having an alignment of uh, all these countries basically preparing for uh, military hostility, all against it. The only country in the world that is pressing for war is the United States and its satellites. Uh, it, uh, it will. Uh, it, it is organized uh, color revolutions to put uh, its uh, client dictatorships in power, such as Zelensky in uh, the Ukraine was a color revolution. Uh, the the massacre of civilians uh, in, in uh, 2014. Uh, the, the revolutions in uh, Egypt I've already mentioned that put. Uh, CC uh, in power, uh, only the United States and its puppets are pushing for war. The rest of the world is trying to think, how do we uh, prevent the war? Uh, the United States uh, at the United Nations has been blocking any kind of a military defense uh, of the Palestinians or the Near East, uh, any kind of opposition to the war uh, anywhere in the world. So uh, it looks that, that what is happening now is I think we've discussed before in the channel is can the United Nations survive? Certainly, is it going to, if it survives, is it really going to be located in New York? The purpose of the United Nations was to prevent war crimes. We're seeing war crimes occur in uh, Palestine today. Uh, uh, without the United Nations being able to do anything about it. The United Nations was supposed to have been founded to bring about world peace, but it can't be world peace if the United States has veto power that vetoes any attempt to uh, prevent war or to isolate uh, the uh, parties who are waging war, uh, isolate the United States, uh, Israel, uh, Ukraine, uh, and other uh, arms of uh, uh, the United States. So uh, the, it, uh, 
looks like the whole world interconnections have reached a breaking point. The uh, ocean transport interconnection, the international law interconnections. Uh, you, uh, the United States said, uh, we're against international law. We're for the rule, rules-based order. Our rules-based order is we support genocide. Uh, and we will not uh, support uh, the United Nations providing relief to the victims. Uh, the victims should be killed. Uh, that because uh, we've uh, supported uh, the Israeli government. The world is so revulsed by all of this that this has become a sort of emotional catalyst to finally following their own economic self-interest and going in their own uh, direction and say, all right, okay, we do need a new kind of international order. Uh, we're going to create uh, an alternative to the whole set of institutions that the United States created way back in 1944 and 1945 when World War II was ending. We're at the end of the World War II order. We're at the end of the US-centered order. Uh, we're going to have to create a world that the United States cannot interrupt by uh, 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 paralyzing our government policy of uh, creating our own form of world trade, our own alternative to the dollar standard by our de-dollarizing, our own uh, uh, in, uh, form of uh, mutual investment among the BRICS plus countries. You're having very rapidly uh, negotiations all over the global majority of 85% of the world trying to create an alternative as it sees uh, the threat of war growing in, uh, in uh, the Near East and uh, uh, in Africa, uh, basically. And uh, the only hope, obviously, is to prevent this from erupting into an entire world war uh, and to try to isolate it uh, just between the United States and its allies. Uh, it looks like Europe is going to be left uh, behind continental Europe uh, for the next uh, few decades. Uh, probably North America will end up being isolated. And uh, uh, Eurasia, Africa, maybe South America uh, will all form uh, a new kind of world. So you're having a whole new uh, political atlas uh, being outlined. And uh, the institutions for mutual aid and mutual support and mutual defense uh, among these countries uh, and the result will be that instead of the United States trying to sanction uh, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, uh, China uh, uh, with trade sanctions and investment sanctions, uh, it, it will end up uh, the United States and Europe and its allies uh, or satellites will be uh, sanctioned and isolated themselves uh, to go their own way. So. Basically, uh, most of our discussions, I think, on uh, on the, these meetings have been, uh, what form uh, will the world take? And I tried to spend uh, spend a day not talking about uh, uh, what is happening in Eurasia, but uh, just to help you understand how uh, completely different this year's elections in the United States will be, and all over the world this year in 2024, so many countries are having elections. Not only the United States but Russia, many European countries, many Asian countries. This year is a turning point in history. For the first time since 1945, this year is the turning point. The fact that uh, most of the population really is neither, uh, doesn't support either parties, uh, uh, presidential candidates. Well, uh, one of the reasons that I'm working with Jill Stein is we both realize that uh, the United States as a society cannot go forward without destroying the Democratic Party's control. The Democratic Party is uh, the war party. Uh, it's the party of Wall Street. Uh, it's the anti-labor party. It's the support of monopolies. It's a party of international aggression and finding enemies in every other country of the world that it cannot control. We're not a democracy or an oligarchy. And specifically, we're a financial oligarchy, where the candidates for uh, public office have to do rely on private funding. And uh, you're having the billionaires take over 
the funding and uh, backing candidates who support the policies that the billionaires want to see, whether they're monopoly policies, tax policies, freeing the billionaires from taxes, or whether they're military policies that the billionaires support. So uh, you're having uh, America really being on the right wing of the whole international spectrum. You say the right wing is war and the left wing is uh, peace, then America is at the tip of the bell-shaped curve, and it's the very fat uh, tail of the bell-shaped curve, is the military uh, aggressive wing promoting financialization, uh, neoliberalization, and a, a shift of the tax burden off Wall Street, off real estate, onto labor and industry. And so uh, is uh, the advocating uh, its position as a party of peace, it realized that there cannot be world peace without uh, winding down the Democratic Party's control and, re and giving Americans the ability to uh, vote for presidential candidates, senators, and congressmen that are not uh, simply uh, put in, uh, uh, on the ballot by uh, the wealthy groups that control both political parties in the United States. All over the world, uh, about a decade ago uh, and more, uh, the populations were worried about global warming. And they saw the power of the oil industry and other industries uh, to be polluters. And they realized that the uh, oil industry and uh, its allies were uh, in control of uh, the leading uh, parties. And so there had to be a third party that was pushing for global warming. Uh, so many parties called themselves the Green. Uh, in Germany, for instance, the Greens begin uh, is, uh, is an anti-war party saying, well, war certainly is not good for the environment. Well, the United States uh, so, uh, used its non-government organizations and NED, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, to sort of push its own leadership. The United States has been able to co-opt uh, the leadership of uh, the European and foreign labor parties, social democratic parties, and uh, even the Green parties. Uh, they haven't been able uh, to co-opt uh, the Green Party in the United States. And so Jill Stein was the candidate, I think, in 2016. And uh, because she's the most vocal speaker and uh, writer, and because she's realized that the fight for environmental stability is uh, also means a fight against war. That one of the great threats to uh, the, uh, the environment, one of the great forces uh, causing global warming is all of the pollution of uh, the military buildup that the United States is sponsoring all over the world. So uh, whereas in Germany, uh, the Green Party uh, is supporting the war. The Green Party uh, is supporting uh, ad advocacy now of just the reverse of everything green. Well, in the United States, uh, uh, Jill uh, has realizes that an anti-war uh, uh, position goes hand in hand with a present uh, preservation of the environment and uh, preventing global warming from uh, occurring more. I'm uh, uh, one of her uh, economic advisors, and uh, I've brought uh, the team that I had when we were working for Dennis Kucinich uh, in 2008. Uh, Kucinich was the peace candidate uh, who was uh, kept off the ballot by, uh, again, Democratic Party maneuvering. Uh, the Democrats have a group of billionaires that promise to spend uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat any left-wing candidate. And uh, for this year's elections, the Democrats are trying to get rid of what's called the squad in uh, Congress. Any congressman that votes against support of Israel or support of the Palestinians is being opposed by a huge backing of uh, the Zionist candidates in every uh, congressional district. So you're having uh, the uh, elections in the United States be privatized. Uh, Jill does not have any contribution from any billionaire. Uh, the funding of the Green Party uh, is almost exclusively small personal donations. Uh, the, uh, the candidates for the Green Party are, are not uh, doing what 
other candidates uh, do. For instance, if you're running either for the Republican or the Democrat in any given district, you think, well, who are the rich people in the district who want a favor? Who are the landlords? I've got to get the landlords on my side. Uh, I'll support uh, uh, your landlord interest against the renters uh, if you give, you know, give me campaign contribution. You know, does the uh, city or state have a big industry? If it's a logging industry, I'll go to the forestry and a logging interest to get money. If it's uh, oil producing, I'll go to the oil uh, 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 companies to get something. So the result is that uh, 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 senators and representatives into the United States are really frontmen uh, uh, and lobbyists for the special interests who give them enough money to buy the uh, campaign uh, activities, the television uh, commercials, the radio commercials, the broadcast commercial uh, commercials, the support in the popular press, uh, which also is owned by the wealthiest classes in, in every uh, city and every state. Uh, so you really have uh, the oligarchy throwing all of its financial uh, support behind uh, oligarchy nominees. Uh, and then you have people who are not in the oligarchy. Uh, Bernie Sanders used this tactic very well in uh, 2016. And you had all of the dirty tricks pulled by the Democratic National Committee and saying, we don't, and the case went to uh, uh, the courts and the court said, actually the Democratic Party is the uh, dozen or so members of uh, who control the Democratic Corporation. And it doesn't matter who the voters vote for. It's the members, it's the, uh, the billionaires and the lobbyists on the corporations acting on behalf of uh, the oligarchy who get to control who are the uh, actual nominees who are going to be permitted on the ballot for Americans to vote for. So the third party, uh, Jill Stein, is probably the leading third party candidate that uh, is saying there is an alternative. The uh, Democrats and Republicans have tried to block anyone like a peace candidate, like a candidate opposing uh, uh, global warming uh, uh, from access to the ballot. So what she's trying to do is uh, get uh, enough publicity so people know what her position is. Well, as you can imagine, uh, the newspapers and television uh, try to pretend that she doesn't exist. There's a blackout. The newspapers are talking about uh, the Republican candidate, the Democratic candidates. Uh, she, she can't even get on the uh, nominal uh, liberal programs that are supposed to give you uh, the big picture. Uh, she does have uh, an in, a following on the internet. She has an uh, Instagram policy identity where uh, she puts her speeches there. She has dozens and dozens of her speeches on in Instagram. There was a big demonstration last month in Washington, a huge anti-war demonstration to support the Palestinians against genocide. Hardly a word of this in the newspapers. She was there uh, addressing it and uh, others were there. None of them are really reported. So you're having a sort of a news blackout in support of the Republican Democrat duopoly uh, uh, on television, newspapers, uh, radio, even in the internet now. Uh, there's a very heavy censorship of any criticism of America's war policy uh, on uh, uh, Twitter or X, as it's now called, on Facebook or on the other social media. So you're having, uh, an, a, you're really, this is the year in which uh, the United States has to decide, is it going to become a police state or not? Just we must put the war in a big background to think about. 西方的资本可以通过新殖民主义的全球化，进一步推进它的产业资本扩张和金融资本扩张的时候，这个时候你们大家看到的都是各种各样的非常美好的说法，啊，推进你们的改革，推进你们的开放，帮助你们的人民得到更好的福利等等。我们也都知道，世界上各个主要经济体都不是被外部问题造成的严重困境，而很大程度上都是内部问题造成。任何一个国家都应该
尊重城市劳动，不应该尊重攫取。只有在一线政策部门，对，你是知道经济社会发展过程中间真实问题出在哪儿了。有一个宏观的视野，嗯、能看到天下。